Hello, and uh, well, welcome to this Amazon Partner Webinar for provisioning workloads on Amazon Web Services with Red Hat Cloud Forms and Ansible. My name is David Duncan. I'm one of the Partner Solutions Architects at AWS. And with me here is one of Red Hat's Certified Cloud and Service Provider Program Technical Evangelists. Nicholas Gerasimatos. Nicholas is here today to help us get a better understanding of how Red Hat Cloud Forms assist customers in enforcing policies and ensuring compliance for workloads running in Amazon Web Services. You'll see how Red Hat Cloud Forms extends the same level of control that Cloud Forms customers already enjoyed for virtualization and private cloud workloads to the public cloud. Just a quick reminder for the uh, question and answer sessions. You may ask your questions at any time by typing them in the panel of the webinar questions section. After the webinar, we'll have a live Q&A session, at which time Nicholas and I will answer as many of your questions about AWS, Red Hat Cloud Forms, and Ansible Tower that we can, we can respond to in the allotted time. If your questions are not answered during the Q&A, then we will respond directly through email associated with your registration. Finally, if you think of something afterwards, don't hesitate to contact Nicholas or myself at the email addresses you see on your screen. So let's get started, shall we? Red Hat and Amazon Web Services have a long-standing partnership and have put many hours in collaboration around extending the same level of control and functionality to our common customers that they already enjoy with Red Hat for their workload. Simplicity and scalability are essential components in an enterprise class computing environment. Red Hat and AWS extend customer choice by providing many different tools and techniques for scaling workloads to meet the needs of demanding customer workloads. Security will always be the top priority for our customers. Both AWS and Red Hat develop software in collaboration with customers from a range of industries, including government agencies and financial institutions. We use this valuable feedback to build rigorous security protocols into our products, features, and services. Your software is not only built strong, it's defended. With AWS, CIOs can use these tools like Red Hat Cloud Forms and Ansible, along with integrating Amazon services like AWS Config and features such as resource tagging to see exactly what cloud assets their company is using at any moment. No more hidden servers under the desk or anonymously placed servers in a rack plugged into the corporate network. Open source is a natural companion to Amazon Web Services business model. Open source technology is a powerful and flexible component of our common customer solutions and AWS customers want to run services on top of those open projects backed by Red Hat engineering operations and support. AWS customers are choosing to run the, these open source solutions in part because they allow them the freedom to move workloads around. They don't want to feel locked into any one place. Everything we do starts with our customers and works backwards from there. Roughly 90 to 95% of the AWS roadmap is driven by what our customers tell us matters. Customers who are really committed to using the cloud know that the best way to illustrate openness and customer flexibility is by what you actually provide and deliver for them. Red Hat and AWS offerings are dedicated to providing the most cost-effective, reliable, secure, and high-performance solutions. We take your requirements seriously and move quickly. Amazon Web Services has a broad ecosystem of partners and customers. Today, AWS has millions of active customers of all sizes and in all segments, including more than 2,300 government agencies, 7,000 education institutions, and more than 22,000 nonprofit organizations that have used AWS in the last 12 months. There is a thriving partner ecosystem. Over 10,000 APN partners joined the AWS Partner Network in the past 12 months, and they include thousands of new APN technology partners, and thousands of new APN consulting partners. The majority of the Fortune 500 companies and over 90% of the Fortune 100 companies 
utilize AWS APN partner solutions and services. Trusted Advisor inspects your AWS environment to find opportunities that can save you money, improve your system performance, increase your application reliability, and help you implement security best practices. Since 2013, customers have viewed over 2.6 million best practice recommendations and realized over $350 million in estimated cost reductions. Access to the full set of Trusted Advisor checks helps to optimize your entire AWS infrastructure, helping to increase security and performance and reduce your overall costs. Behind the scenes, we are continuously enhancing reliability, performance, and efficiency of our operations through extensive use of custom-designed data center architectures, networking, and equipment. We've lowered our prices on 62 different occasions, and we will continue to do that. So Amazon has spent over a decade building one of the world's largest, most reliable, secure, scalable, and cost-efficient web infrastructures. And we bring that experience with us to AWS. The mindset we have is that we need to earn our customers' business every hour, every day, every month, every year. And we've been very fortunate that in more than 10 years of business, very few companies have chosen to leave us because of our operational performance, security, the breadth and depth of our services, and the pace of innovation, and our customer-focused approach. In 2011, we released over 80 significant services and features. In 2012, nearly 160. In 2013, 280. In 2014, 516. In 2015, we launched 722. In 2016, we launched more than 1,000 new services and features. And as of April 1st, we've launched 236 new features and services in 2017. Elastic Volumes is a feature of Amazon EBS that allows you to dynamically increase capacity, tune performance, and change the type of live volumes with no downtime or performance impact. This allows you to easily right-size your deployment and adapt to performance changes. EBS magnetic volumes are backed by hard disk drives and can be used for workloads with smaller data sets where data is, data is accessed infrequently or when performance consistency isn't of the primary importance. EBS magnetic volumes can provide up to 48,000 IOPS per instance. SSD back volumes include the highest performance provisioned IOPS for latency-sensitive transactional workloads, and general-purpose SSD that balance price and performance for a wide variety of transactional data. SSD back volumes can provide up to 75,000 IOPS per instance. Amazon Web Services provides a broad set of products and services you can use as building blocks to run sophisticated and scalable applications. Running your applications in the AWS cloud can help you move faster, operate more securely, and save substantial costs, all while benefiting from the scale and performance of the cloud. The Red Hat Summit announcement around native integration of AWS service brokers in Red Hat OpenShift makes it easier for Red Hat OpenShift customers to easily build applications and consume these AWS services and features using simple, easy to integrate options directly from the OpenShift Container Platform web console or the OpenShift CLI. By working closely with enterprises, AWS has developed the industry's broadest set of hybrid capabilities across storage, networking, security, application deployment, and management tools to make it easy for you to integrate the cloud as a seamless and secure extension of your existing invest investments. We've also created strategic partnerships with longtime leaders and on-premises platforms providers, such as Red Hat and others, to allow you to run your existing enterprise applications on AWS with full support and high performance. Amazon Virtual Private Cloud lets you provision a logically isolated section of the AWS cloud where you can launch AWS resources in a virtual network that you define. AWS Direct Connect makes it easy to establish a dedicated network connection from your, your on-premises to AWS. Using AWS Direct Connect, you can establish private connectivity between AWS and your data center, office, or your co-location environment, which in many cases can reduce your network costs, increase bandwidth throughput, and provide a more consistent network experience than internet-based connections. 
Tools like VM Import Export enables you to import virtual machine images easily from your existing environment to Amazon EC2 instances and export them back to your on-premises environment. AWS IAM supports federation from corporate systems like Microsoft Active Directory as well as external web identity providers like Google and Facebook. And now I'll turn it over to Nicholas to continue this discussion on Red Hat Cloud Forms and Ansible. Thanks, Nicholas. Thanks, David. So my name is Nicholas Drossomatos. Uh, I work in the CCSP group at Red Hat, um, specifically dealing with certified cloud service providers. So that would be uh, Amazon Web Services, for example. So a little bit about Red Hat for those that don't know. Uh, Red Hat's been actually trusted in the technology industry for greater than nine years. Uh, more than 90% of Fortune 500 companies trust Red Hat solutions to run their production and development environments. Red Hat has a successful track record of addressing 98% of critical vulnerabilities within one calendar day of them being made public. And we're very proud of the fact that Red Hat Solutions have uh, helped enterprise customers achieve five nines of availability. So it's important when discussing technology and solutions uh, to first determine what problems we're attempting to solve. So this help, helps us determine if the issue is related to technology, operations, uh, business drivers, things along those lines, right? It can also be needing to bring products to market more rapidly or doing more with less. Uh, we've seen over the last few years, infrastructure has moved towards software and code as a service. So some people are referring to this as uh, SaaS or software as a service, but I think it's kind of important to recognize that this is more of developing and deploying code to agnostic infrastructure, right? You shouldn't be directly tied into where you're deploying your code. This infrastructure should be able to live in the cloud or live in your data center um, in many instances, it's a combination of your code and software application stacks living in a hybrid world, right? Living in both pu public and private cloud um, and public and private data centers. Uh, the next thing we need to consider also is how do Red Hat solutions address these problems? Uh, if the problem is deploying or managing software, lifecycle management and such, which, what tools should you use? Uh, why should you use these tools? Also, it's important to consider that some tools and solutions can be bundled or leveraged to work together Sometimes these solutions, when bundled together, play nicely with one another. And as we all know, sometimes uh, integration is a little bit more complex and complicated. Uh, Red Hat attempts to address this by having our solutions play nicely together across all the different software verticals. So this could be development, continuous integration, continuous deployment, code development, containers, operations, management, security remediation, chargeback, showback, uh, capacity planning, things along those lines. So what does this holy grail of software look like? Right? Everybody is trying to figure out this single pane of glass for management and being able to get full visibility into the infrastructures. Um, in the eyes of Red Hat, we see management becoming more automated. So people are wanting to use automation or orchestration across multiple tools to accomplish more with less and to do such with a zero failure rate or at least lowering their failure rates. Uh, so for example, automating tasks can reduce the complexity for code deployment, thus mitigating human errors. Uh, another example is using tools and solutions to scan your environment for critical vulnerabilities in real time and addressing those vulnerabilities autonomously. So before we dive into the solution stack that I was talking about, let's talk a little bit about uh, the what, where, and the how. So what are we deploying? Well, code or software, right? Applications that generate revenue for a company or provide a service to users. These users can be employees or customers, right? So it doesn't necessarily when we think of a customer, it doesn't have to be a general consumer. You could have business units within uh, a company that are also customers as well. Um, the where, where are we deploying it? Why should it matter? Uh, our code and software should work anywhere and everywhere without us worrying. We also make sure that uh, the code we deploy has support. So if we run into problems, we can engage the vendor or vendors to help expedite the solution. Shouldn't matter if you're deploying to Amazon Web Services or within your own uh, data center. That's the only thing that should matter is that it's a standard platform that's certified and that the operating system that spans these infrastructures is the same operating system, right? So Red Hat in the cloud, Red Hat in your data center, Red Hat on your laptop doesn't necessarily matter. Um, and then how are we doing these things? So a combination of cloud forms, Ansible Tower, Red Hat Insights, and Satellite are great solutions to help accomplish this, um, specifically the what, where, and how. Uh, one thing that I wanted to point out also is that roughly 75% of IT groups spend over trillions of dollars a year on software, and that is trillions, not a small margin of funds by any means. So Red Hat management uh, automated, right? Uh, from development to deployment, less than three hours with these ingredients. Uh, I like this slide. It's always been one of my favorite ones. So 
Let's dig into the solutions I mentioned previously. Um, getting from de development to deployment in three hours or less. It sounds pretty amazing, right? You know, how do you, how, how can you do something like that? Um, cloud performance is a critical component that helps glue everything together. Uh, it can be leveraged for reporting, capacity planning, hooking into Ansible Tower for automated deployments, providing an API endpoint for developers, also provides a GUI or a user interface for others who prefer to do things in more of a point and click type of manner, as opposed to using, um, you know, automation or, or APIs or CLI, things along those lines, right? Um, cloud performance also allows you to see and interact with multiple different cloud providers, and that could be your public and private network. So it can have visibility into your AWS workloads and your Red Hat OpenStack workloads that are running in your own data center. Uh, the same tool can be used to deploy these workloads and configure services such or view utilization and costs. So it's completely agnostic and it, for the most part, uh, infrastructure to it is, is kind of ambiguous, right? It just needs an API to hook into. Um, as for Red Hat Satellite, it's an infrastructure management product specifically designed to uh, help keep Red Hat uh, Enterprise Linux environments and other Red Hat infrastructure solutions running efficiently. Um, it also helps with properly securing those environments and keeping you compliant with various standards. Uh, satellite also allows for provisioning of bare metal workloads, virtualized infrastructure. So once again, regardless of public or private cloud, it can do all of this from a single centralized console and all with a standardized process. So we can use a systematic process to apply content, which includes patches, updates, fixes, things along those lines to deployed systems in all stages. These could be in development, QA, smoke testing, or in production. Uh, this results in better consistency and availability of systems. So it lets your IT staff respond more quickly uh, to business needs and vulnerabilities. Um, another great feature of Satellite is it allows for reporting and mapping of Red Hat products to register systems, brand and visibility to subscription usage details. Uh, as we all know, sometimes it gets really difficult to uh, determine how many subscriptions have been allocated, where they're being used, things along those lines, right? Uh, Ansible Tower. So it helps you scale your IT automation, uh, managing complex deployments and speeding productivity. Uh, also allows you to centralize and control your IT infrastructure with a visual dashboard, uh, role-based access controls, you know, ACLs, job scheduling, integrated notifications and a graphical inventory management, dynamic, um, not to mention the Ansible Tower's REST API and CLI make it easy to embed Tower into existing tools and processes. So you don't have to take something that you're already currently using and throw it away. You can actually hook Ansible Tower into some of these endpoints. And if you're using cloud forms, you'll also see that you could do that even more. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that um, coming up. So Ansible Tower and cloud forms fit nicely together. They can leverage one another for managing day one and day two operations. Doesn't matter if you're deploying a net new greenfield workload or if you're actually managing a brownfield workload. It, and regardless of where the endpoint for that application or software stack lives, right? So this simplifies the lives of your developers as well as your operation group. Um, then there's Red Hat Insights. So Red Hat Insights provides comprehensive analytics across physical, virtual, containers, public, private cloud environments. Uh, helps you and your business to save time and money, obviously, by addressing problems um, in, in a rapid manner, right? So Red Hat Insights lets you know about these vulnerabilities before they actually affect your environment. You don't have to you know, get that, that phone call in the middle of the night that some of your systems have been compromised and this uh, update or patch has been rolled out a week ago, but no one's been checking some type of uh, manual website to determine when you know, these CVs are being released and things along those lines. Red Hat's can actually, uh, Red Hat Insights can actually let you know. So it also allows the ability to deploy and scale quickly uh, with no in additional infrastructure uh, requirements and teams can immediately initiate tailored remediation steps. So this allows you to decrease security threats and uh, also avoid downtime. In fact, uh, you can actually download Ansible Automation directly from Red Hat Insights to remediate or resolve threats and issues with uh, via Red Hat Insights, right? So you can actually download these, these playbooks uh, from Red Hat Insights, import them into Ansible, and use them to remediate certain uh, vulnerabilities and things along those lines. So uh, Insights enables uh, significant time savings and helps you avoid firefighting. So by enabling automatic resolution of critical issues before they actually affect your business, um, it also helps operate, uh, operationalize and optimize your environment and boosting your security. So let's talk a little bit about application autonomy. So application autonomy. Uh, as many are familiar, uh, many applications have been built on the end-tier paradigm, right? This has been around for a very, very, very long time. 
commonly referred as to the M plus one or M plus two architecture. Uh, the design allows for a failure to occur without providing impact to an application or a subset of these applications. So if a storage array goes offline, you're still up and running. If a set of web servers fails, you're still up and running, right? It doesn't impact the business. So in your data center, you may use disjointed networks or servers allocated to specific pods, separated segmented storage, things along those lines. In the public cloud, like AWS, for example, usually deploy these applications to multiple regions or availability zones to help guarantee uptime and mitigate any types of failures you might encounter, right? These could be um, systematic errors, they could be software errors, or it could just be one user who actually makes a mistake when they're actually deploying an application or something along those lines, right? So while NTR is still technically relevant, I prefer to think of uh, the next generation of application infrastructure as distributed applications. So this encompasses things like microservices and such, uh, containers, for example. A little outside what we're discussing today, but I highly encourage you to go take a look at microservices and containers, take a look at Red Hat OpenShift. Um, you'll see that that's kind of like the, the driving direction where everything is, is moving, right? making things simpler to deploy at scale and breaking down applications so that they're not so large and monolithic and actually have them be more distributed. Um, the main problem, obviously, with deploying applications at scale, you know, is for a long time it's been a manual process. Uh, you know, you could say things like scripting have helped. Uh, solutions are, but those solutions are kind of more of a band-aid to the real problem. Uh, it also doesn't scale. So while, you know, writing a bunch of custom bash scripts and things along those lines might work for your environment when you have 50 or 100 servers. It becomes infinitely more complex when you start moving into the high hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of servers or even containers, right? When you start getting to that type of scale, it becomes really, really difficult to use manual tasks to do remediation. Uh, so the combination of cloud forms, Ansible, and satellite together helps solve these issues of managing at scale by providing with a fully integrated platform. Uh, solutions that play nicely together to accomplish what could be considered mundane tasks, uh, deploying infrastructure, applications, patching, updating inventory management, lifecycle control, things along those lines. Uh, also across various endpoints, as I mentioned previously. And you'll see that is constantly a theme, right? We're agnostic when it comes to our tooling. We, we want you to be able to use AWS. We want you to be able to manage those AWS workloads. We want you to be able to manage your private data center workloads. We want those same tools to manage any of these tasks and do it in an agnostic manner across any location or environment, really helping simplify uh, your infrastructure and your management process. So here's an example of uh, what an interior application looks like. Basically, it's fairly simple, right? You have your ingress and your egress to a load balancer or load balancers, and a grouping of web servers, uh, could be with middleware as well. Uh, this handles the traffic pulling information from a database or cluster of databases or even multiple databases. So this is a very generic looking uh, design of what an N-tier type of application would look like. So what do we need to automate the deployment of an N-tier distributed application? So obviously first thing we need is to create the initial system, right? You can't really deploy any code or software if it doesn't have a place to go. So you need a tool or some way to configure these systems as they're being deployed or after they're being deployed. Um, so this could be deploying an application or securing and locking down the operating systems, applying policies, ACLs, things along those lines, right? And you need a secure place to get the software from. You want you know, a secure place that you actually trust to download your security updates and your patches and fixes. Um, you don't want your systems administrators or operations teams to go browse the internet and download security patches and fixes some, from some random torrent site, right? Um, and you need a tool to start tying all of these things together, something that's intelligent, something that can update dynamically, something that can scale. And of course, we need some place where users, developers, managers, whomever, right, executives, uh, regardless of their group or technology level, can actually log in to access uh, or request workloads or services or servers or deploy net new or greenfield infrastructure, or update existing systems, or pull reports. So. It's, it's really nice to have a single pane of glass. So what does this kind of look like? So the solution looks a little like this. Cloud Farms is leveraged to create the initial system. Okay? For example, deploying uh, the instances to AWS, uh, satellite can then be can, you, you know, leveraged to configure these systems, apply updates, policies, and patches, can act as the trusted repo for where all the software is pulled from. Then Ansible could come in and do the heavy lifting of automating all the things, right? I'm sure everybody's kind of seeing the slide where it says automate all the things. So 
CloudFormance also provides the, the API endpoint and UI for individuals to access and request workloads. Um, it also provides a whole host of other things as well, including capacity planning, operations management, remediation, it ties into Insight, it ties into the Tower. Um, it really, CloudFormance is kind of the, the wrapper around these really great tools like Satellite and Insight and Ansible Tower. Um, so really, what, what does all of this look like? So CloudForms provides you the, the capability to order a service in the CloudForms self-service portal, right? We really want to move towards like this whole self-service management in, instead of having to file requests and wait for people or individuals to actually go and provision workloads. We want to be able to do this on our own, especially if you're using things like AWS where you don't really have to worry as much about your infrastructure. So when it comes to capacity planning, you know, AWS does all that heavy lifting, right? They want to make sure that there's plenty of capacity available when it comes to storage and compute and things along those lines and balancing workloads, um, things along those lines, right? But um, you still want this, this same self-service portal because what if you're running stuff in your own data center and maybe you want to abstract that out from the user. The user doesn't really care what it's running on. They just want it deployed in a certain geolocation or region. So for example, user comes in, and they say, I want to deploy four instances, and I want these instances to be deployed on AWS. Awesome. So CloudForms goes, it gets the request from them, from the catalog, and it says, I'm going to go and I'm going to handle this for you. So it passes the control over to Satellite for the OS configuration, for errata updates, uh, security fixes, really to do the configuration management of the system after it's brought up. Because when you just bring up a, an instance or a server, it, there's nothing there, right? It's, it's a blank template. Unless you pre-configured it, it's really, for the most part, it's an empty shell. And then you want to automatically deploy the Insights client directly into that server, and then you want to pass control to Ansible Tower for application deployment. So that all of this is happening in, in a very chronological and autonomous order, a very logical order, so that you actually bring up the server, secure it, harden it, deploy your application, Determine if there's any vulnerabilities that need to be addressed because maybe that vulnerability just was released today and the updates that you were previously patching your servers with, you're 30 days behind or something along those lines. And then Ansible comes in and does all the configuration management, does all the wonderful little magic, and it comes back and it says, hey, this is, this is perfectly fine and it's been great. And then CloudForm sits there and it monitors the progress and informs the user when it's complete. So you execute the task through a single button. You say, I want to deploy a web server. And it goes through the process of actually pulling from the catalog all these different dependencies and things along those lines, and it goes and builds this web server for you. So how do you set up self-service and cloud forms, right? Super simple. Straightforward approach, virtual machines or groups of virtual machines. So uh, cloud forms can consume and store things like heat templates, uh, AWS cloud formations templates. Um, it can automatically also create dialogues from parameters in those templates. So that is a type of uh, dialogues could be, which geolocation do you want to deploy this to? Or what size of instance do you want to deploy it to? Or is this going to be a web server or a middleware server? Or what version of Apache do you want to actually install on the server, right? You can actually lead these users through deploying a server without having to actually go and like uh, request, you know, some type of form to be filled out. You can do it through a self-service portal, right? And really, you're empowering your users to go and and request these workloads as opposed to having to dedicate your operations team to go and do all these mundane tasks. And more importantly is the fact that CloudForms integrates and connects directly to Ansible Tower for that configuration management, right? So these service dialogues can be based on surveys that are in uh, Ansible job templates. And we actually provide a ton of Ansible job templates that are actually integrated directly with Ansible Tower. But if you look on Git and if you look around, you could find tons of uh, Ansible job templates that have already been created by other individuals. Um, you know, a lot of pe people who go to Ansible meetups and things along those lines attend Summit, they share all this information with one another. I mean, that's one of the great things about being in, a, in an open source, open ecosystem community. Everybody is trying to work together for the most part to actually, um, you know, push things forward and make things simpler. Um, and then obviously, you know, having the ability to customize service dialogues after you create them. So you don't want it to be static and you don't want to have to go create a new service dialogue every single time you want to go and update something. So for example, maybe you were spreading everything over, 
US West, you know, whichever region, and you don't want to use that region anymore because a certain type of instance that's there, you don't want to get your users access to that instance, for example. And so you want to point them into a different location. Instead of having to go create an entire new uh, service dialogue, you can actually just edit the current one. So Cloud Forms also allows you to tie together multiple self-service items. So for example, as I was mentioning earlier about a, a, a web server. So user comes in and says, I want to deploy a web server. But then they think about it and they say, you know what, I really need this to be like a load balanced web cluster. More, more important for me to have something like that. Um, instead of having to go in and have them deploy three web servers and then a load balancer and all of this other stuff, it can actually, you can actually, when you're building out these self-service items and cloud forms in your catalog, you can tie in multiple of these ser services together, okay? So, um, for example, single click deploys the web servers, deploys the elastic load balancer, pulls all the information, does the configuration management, sends an email out and says, hey, it's done. This also could be done after you do your initial deployment. Okay, so it, in the day two portion of it um, is specifically kind of tied into um, what do you do when it comes to remediation or what, what are you going to do when it comes to updating multiple web servers and patches and fixes and things along those lines. Because it, day one is actually a lot easier than it comes to uh, day two, as we all know. So here's an example of what a self-service catalog look, looks like. So for example, this is a load balanced WordPress cluster. You can see there's a cloud formation template that's being leveraged for four node load balanced web Apache with Maria database cluster. Um, and then it's also deploying this uh, with Satellite 6 and it's pulling all of those uh, specifications from the Satellite 6 host groups that it's actually uh, bundled within. So this is exactly what it looks like when it comes to catalog bundles. Pretty self-explanatory, right? So we have a small demo um, that I'm going to show you a little bit about some of the integration points of uh, cloud forms, how Tower hooks into cloud forms, how satellite and OpenSCAP, things along those lines integrate as well. So this is the uh, Red Hat Cloud Forms man Management Engine uh, login. So if you log in here, you'll actually get to the dashboard. Okay, And for the dashboard, you have your, your general uh, information that you're collecting here. So um, your snapshot counts, virtual infrastructure platforms that you're currently managing, your guest OS counts, um, projects. There's a lot of information. The great thing about the dashboard is you can actually customize and build your own individual widgets. So um, you could actually do it pretty easily. Um, we use it utilizing like a lot of the different services that are built directly into cloud forms. We try and simplify the process of doing that. Uh, there'll be a link at the end of our presentation where you can actually go and download a free book that actually talks all about cloud forms and building all sorts of really cool things from services to cloud providers to networks to deploying middleware, doing control and automation, things along those lines. So for example, as I mentioned, you can see here we have uh, VMware and then we have our cloud uh, providers that are all here. Um, and if you go and you click over into the overview for Red Hat Insights, you actually have the ability here where you can see uh, all the different security stuff that's actually being pulled in from Insights and things that you should address, right? So on the left, you have a chart that basically you're allowed to drill down and discover problems. And on the right-hand side, it provides actually the specific details. So current kernel vulnerabilities to man in the middle versus payload inject injection attacks, things along those lines, right? Could be multiple different things. And if you click on any of these things, so let's say, for example, it's kernel vulnerabilities, you can actually see systems that are being impacted by this vulnerability inside your environment that are attached to cloud forms at this point in time that are using Insight. And then if you click even further, you can actually find more information on it. So it, it says the issue that's detected, it tells you about resolution, um, it, you know, steps for resolution, detected issue, things along those lines, right? It provides you all the very specific details for this uh, insights alert. And then if you go over to configuration and then in management, you can actually see here we have uh, Satellite 6 configured uh, and Ansible Tower. So they're both hooked into this Cloud Forms management provider. Okay. And obviously we have a 3.0 and a 3.1 data in here. And then uh, if you go to the uh, templates, these are all the, the pre-configured templates that um, 
we provide that you can either download, you can use um, ones that are com you know, community driven, things along those lines. But here's where you can actually see them. You also can grab parameters from here. So when you're creating your dialogues, it makes it a lot easier for you to go and grab a lot of this information. So for example, if we select one of these, um, like creating an AWS load balancer, you can see the variables on here, the load balancer name, uh, the instance IDs that you're going to want to be specifically uh, attaching to that uh, ELB. So if we go and we take a look at uh, cloud providers, you can see obviously here we have uh, AWS that's hooked into it. We have OpenStack Cloud and a few other different cloud providers. And if you uh, click in there and you take a look at the summary, you can actually see availability zones, your host aggregates, cloud tenants, how many different flavors you actually have available within your uh, environments, uh, security groups, instances. Uh, basically, it, it's an overview and a layout of your entire AWS infrastructure that's being consumed currently. And if you click on the AWS services thing, you can actually see uh, you know, the ability to leverage uh, S3 buckets, deploying ELBs, VPCs, you know, security groups, um, using uh, CloudTrail, and you can actually add more of these, right? This is just a very high level overview of just a few that you can actually select and use from. So let's go ahead and uh, take a look a little bit more in depth on here. So if we go and we look in our instances, we can see that these ones are running that are being tagged as green, the ones that are red are stopped. And if we select one of these instances, you can actually see in here that you have the ability from a Linux operations perspective that if you wanna go and you wanna deploy um, a yum update or a cockpit or uh, push Red Hat Insights into it, install a package, right? So there could be an RPM package specifically that you wanna deploy um, or you wanna register the server with uh, satellite six, you could do all that through the user interface. And, and one thing I really wanted to kind of stress on uh, and missed earlier is that cloud forms can actually manage Windows environments too, right? So it's not completely Red Hat Linux. It can manage any Linux infrastructure. Um, it can manage any Windows infrastructure. So for the most part, again, it ties into that whole agnostic theme that we've been trying to, to build out on. So that being said, if you look under Windows Ops, you can see here that if you want to deploy IIS or SQL Express to one of your Windows instances, you have no problems. And then obviously this instance specifically is being tagged for Red Hat Insights, and it's actually saying that these two CDEs are ap applicable um, to this actual instance and should be remediated. So if you click on one of those, you can actually see in here the uh, shared challenge, you know, um, vulnerability of CVE. It tells you the overview, the impact, and it tells you how to mitigate it or resolve it, right? So a uh, resolution could either be actually pushing an update or a patch or a fix, or it could actually be a configuration change that is actually done to the server itself. So for example, like here, they're saying edit Etsy uh, sys control conf, um, and that'll remediate it for you. And then if we go back in here and we look at services and we go back over to the catalogs, Let's load this real quick. You can actually see um, all the different services that we're, we're currently providing uh, to our users to consume, okay? So we have Amazon Operations in here, Hybrid Cloud Automation, OpenShift Operations for containers, uh, things along those lines. Uh, VMware Management as well. So for example, that as I mentioned earlier about the create new uh, AWS ELB, these are the areas where they're actually listed. And here's all service catalog items themselves. So you can actually Take a look here and say, um, you know, the service catalog for creating a new AWS Elastic Load Balancer, the provisioning entry point in it, the uh, Ansible Tower job template that you're actually calling from it, and the catalog that you're pulling from. So obviously Amazon Operations. Um, and then you could add a new button or a new dialog. Um, when you're doing this, so that allows you to go in and edit the service catalog, right? And here is where you can actually start specifying some more of the parameters and details. So. Um, what dialogue do you actually want to present? The dialogue is kind of like the parameters that um, you actually want to be pulling directly from the cloud provider or infrastructure. And then uh, the provider portion of it is what are you using to leverage and run the automation portion of it? So for example, um, here we're using Ansible Tower uh, 3.03. And we're going to create an AWS uh, Elastic Load Balancer. And then obviously you have the ability to deploy these two instances. Uh, different stacks, things along those lines, and you can also see there uh, some more information. So um, the service catalog item, 
uh, for deploying to get a monster app, right? So this monster application is a series of uh, services that are actually being pulled together that are being deployed directly into the, uh, the cloud provider itself. So you can actually edit this one, and then here you actually can see that the catalog is once again still Amazon operations, but the dialog is different because you're actually running a different subset of tasks and you're going to be asking a different subset of questions to the end users. And here, under resources, you specifically can see the uh, resources that are pulled into this catalog bundle. So as I mentioned earlier, the service catalog bundles, you can actually take multiple different services that are being deployed and you can actually bundle them all together into a single um, configuration or deployment, right? So for example, here we're deploying RHEL 7 on AWS, then we're deploying Postgres, then we're deploying another RHEL instance, and then we're doing a JBoss deployment on that last instance. So one predates the other. They have dependencies on each other. That's why there's action orders and provisioning orders. And then, you know, obviously you could set delays and things along those lines. and then deploy on AWS, and then JBoss deployment. And then you can save that. And then obviously, you also have the ability to look at your policy profiles. Okay, so policy profiles are kind of like your security profiles that you want to apply to your servers. These can be currently existing running server, servers in your infrastructure. They don't have to be net new, right? So you can actually say, I want to have my compliance for November and December and January and February and separate all those different things out. So as patches and uh, fixes are released, or as uh, regulations change, for example, let's say um, you previously weren't doing anything with uh, HIPAA, but now you're doing some stuff when it comes to HIPAA compliance, and you need to suddenly remediate all of your infrastructure to make sure that it's HIPAA compliant, you can actually go and you can build some of these policy profiles. And then the actions are what is taken based on those profiles. So for example, um, let's say it, this could be a trigger for for example as well. So like in this action, we're specifically saying if utilization on a certain server hits a certain amount of uh, utilization, deploy another server. Scale this web application deployment, right? Kind of like auto scaling in a sense. So you can actually go in here and say, I want to edit this and then uh, go ahead and say scale web application deployment and job template. And that's it that I have for the demo because I believe we are running pretty close to time. So I will turn it over for uh, some Q&A. And just as I had mentioned previously, uh, you can learn more information here uh, at Mastering Platform's Automation Guide. We'll also make the slides available for you to download. Um, and then there'll be a few demos in there as well that I'll also include um, so that you could actually take a look at some of the features a little bit more in depth. So one of the demos goes kind of into like Ansible Tower and and how it engages um, insights, uh, how insights and satellite play together, and really kind of dig super duper deep into how all these different uh, solutions and services um, complement one, one another to simplify managing your infrastructure. So thanks everyone for joining us for this webinar. We've been really happy to have you here and great questions. So we'll hope to see you for the next one. Thanks everybody, bye.